Lucy and Arthur Hedden, an African-American inventor in Camberley. American independent scholar, Dr. Jill D. Snyder, focuses her work on African-Americans in aviation history. Her new biography follows the inspiring and fascinating life of Lucy and Arthur Hedden. Hedden, an early black American aviator, became a leading industrialist in the 1930s in Camberley, and his inventions helped support the British war effort. Jill carried out some of her research at Surrey History Centre and was to give a talk at the centre about her book for Black History Month. Unfortunately, the coronavirus has prevented her from travelling from the United States. Not to be deterred, she reveals more about Hedden and her research in this Q&A with Di Stiff, Collections Development Archivist at Surrey History Centre. Hi Jill, thanks for chatting with us. To begin, can you tell us a little bit about Hedden's early life and how he developed his ambitions to be an inventor and businessman? Hi Di, thank you for inviting me. Yes, uh, Hedden was born in Carthage, North Carolina in 1879. That was just 14 years after the Civil War ended. And he grew up in Carthage on his grandparents' farm. He'd lost his mother when he was very young, about two years old. Um, Hedden's childhood was by no means an ordinary one. He had the good fortune to be born into a family of craftsmen. And many of his relatives had trained as artisans while enslaved, and after the war, they continued to ply those trades, so they had good, steady incomes. Um, Hedden's grandfather not only farmed his own land, but was a master wheelmaker at the town's buggy company. And Hedden had a great uncle who was a nationally known blacksmith. He designed and sold tools throughout New England and the South. So Hedden's interest in mechanics and design, I think, blossomed from their examples. Hedden also had good models for entrepreneurship. In the early 1890s, um, a forest fire damaged thousands of trees near where they lived, and his father took the opportunity to establish a sawmill to cut and process the lumber. Uh, his company, which he operated with his brother-in-law, did extremely well. And Hedden's great uncle, uh, besides selling his tools, owned a livery stable and a blacksmith shop in downtown Carthage. Other members of his family were active in politics and education, uh, two of his aunts becoming his uh, early teachers in a school established by his childhood pastor. Hedden also had a, a sister nanny, and both he and nanny were educated at this school. As an African-American, how did Hedden overcome the racial inequalities of his day to become a pioneer in engineering? Hedden had to work extremely hard to succeed. Despite the fact that he had an education and financial stability, at a time when that was rare, he couldn't escape any black prejudice. He was among the first generation of African Americans born after the Civil War, and um, he came of age in a period of great danger. Defeated Confederates resorted to a combination of personal intimidation, ridicule, economic pressure, and physical violence to assert control over those who were ostensibly now free. Hedden felt the weight of white hatred throughout his youth, but uh, especially as he moved from being a teenager to a young adult. In 1899, as he was turning 20, North Carolina enacted its first segregation laws, or Jim Crow laws, and soon after that, measures to negate black voting rights. Um, fear also became a powerful part of Hedden's everyday life. In 1900, a young black man was brutally murdered in Carthage, and his body hanged and badly mutilated, and no one was punished. And only a few months later, white supremacists, including paramilitary groups, led a menacing parade through the town's main streets. So Hedden saw violence and the threat of violence all around them. What helped Hedden keep his ambitions in the face of this, I think, were his family, and the social networks that they built. Um, with family resources, he was able to further his education at an advanced boarding school in Franklin, North Carolina, which gave him additional skills and experience. Um, and although he chose to leave the South when he graduated in 1903, over the next two decades, he continued to find support through connections that his childhood pastor and relatives and his first wife, Tina, who he married the same year he graduated, built across the country within the Northern Presbyterian Church, the Republican Party, which was then closer to today's Democratic Party, 
and fraternal and social organizations. Their social networks over the years gave him emotional sustenance and often employment opportunities. They also helped him finance his early inventions and businesses. Um, in the 1920s, Hedden tapped his family's networks and his own business connections to build a coalition of supporters to establish a car company. Uh, the company manufactured a car that he designed both the body and the engine for. Uh, the engine experiments he carried out in the shops of that company led to his first two patents, uh, or as you would say, patents. Um, then patents in hand, he could draw capital from larger scale investors, which allowed him to develop products based on his patents and to market them. Without those networks, I'm not sure he would have been able to do that. So how did Hedden's work bring him to the UK? The first time Hedden came to England was during the First World War uh, to demonstrate an invention to the British Admiralty. Uh, he had designed an optical camouflage device for use on submarine chasers. Chasers were boats sent out to locate and destroy enemy submarines. Um, his device, by diffracting light, reflected to the viewer only water and sky, and that obscured the chaser's presence. And in late 1918, Sir Richard Paget of the Admiralty's Board of Invention and Research recommended development of the invention. But unfortunately, very soon after that, the war suddenly came to an end. That also ended the Admiralty's research and development work, and so Hedden lost that chance. Hedden came back to England 13 years later in 1931. Uh, he came this time to demonstrate a converter kit he had designed to the Royal Auto Club. Uh, his kit allowed a motorist to burn heavy oils instead of petrol in an internal combustion engine. Heavy oils like paraffin and tractor vaporizing oil had been burned in tractors and off-road vehicles since the 19-teens, but Hedden's kit made it possible to use them in automobiles and lorries. The advantage heavy oils had is that they were more plentiful and cheaper than petrol, there was interest in Hedden's kit in the United States, but because the U.S. was an oil-producing country, petrol was relatively cheap. But in the U.K., drivers often faced petrol shortages and faced pain at the pump. So the idea of burning heavy oils in their cars and lorries was pretty appealing. Hedden's demonstration to the Royal Auto Club went well, and it created a bit of a buzz among commercial drivers especially. So rather than returning to the United States, he decided to form a company in London to explore that market. In 1932, he moved the company to Camberley in Surrey, where he established a factory to manufacture his kit. His first business partner was George Hamilton, a British native uh, from Sunderland, who had become an American citizen. And Hamilton remained his partner until 1934. Um, that year, Hedden and a well-known builder in Camberley named James McLean Keel established Head and Keel Engineering, which they operated together until 1947. Do you think escaping American racism was a motivation for Hedden to move to England? To some extent, yes. It's clear from letters he wrote home to his friend Robert Abbott, who was publisher of the Chicago Defender, one of the U.S.'s largest black-owned newspapers, that Hedden did relish freedom from segregation in England. He also expressed gratitude for the country's commitment to the rule of law, something that, as a black man, he couldn't always depend on at home. He'd seen violence in Carthage, and he had lived through the Chicago race riot of 1919. So personal freedom and safety were huge draws for Hedden. He'd also recently divorced, and I think he saw in England an opportunity for a fresh start personally. But that said, Hedden was at heart an inventor and a businessman. He later stated that his 1931 visit was meant simply as a business trip and that he only afterwards decided to stay. I suspect his decision was driven first and foremost by the desire to find the most promising market for his inventions. Had that market been somewhere else, I think somewhere else is where he would have gone. Tell us about his life in Camberley. How did he settle into life here? Hedden thrived in Camberley from the start. He had light brown skin, so he was protected from the discrimination that could sometimes be faced by darker-skinned individuals, and he traveled unimpeded across Britain. He was active in engineering circles, and he attracted major distributors for his products. 
Those included companies like Motor Assessments, Roadless Traction, and Aveling Barford. And by the mid-1930s, he had emerged as a central figure in Camberley's business community. In 1937, the Camberley News described him as one of four local leaders, which also included his business partner, James Keel, who were leading the industrial development of the town. The paper also praised the role of his patented products, which by that time included a popular engine gasket, an oil-burning carburetor, and a more efficient converter kit um, in spreading Camberley's name across the British Commonwealth. Hedden also lived in relative comfort in Camberley. He resided at the Duke of York Hotel and later the Camberley Court Hotel. Camberley Court gave him a garage for his two cars, bowling greens, and central heating and plumbing in his rooms, which was unusual for the time. With the outbreak of war, though, he moved opposite his factory to keep an eye on its operations. He also became very much a trusted local. Although he never became a British citizen, he was one of only a small number of resident aliens allowed to join the Home Guard. He also served as a consulting engineer for nearby industries. After the war, Hedden established a home life, marrying Gladys Hollenby in 1945 and moving to Friendly Green to be near her family. Three years later, um, he and Gladys adopted a son who they named Lucian Arthur Hedden Jr. Hedden remained an admired figure in Camberley after the war. Uh, Lucian Jr. recalls a, a local newspaper publishing a story on his father's career as an inventor and praising his dedication to ensuring that his son received a solid education. Um, which was a difficult task after the war when so many schools had been destroyed and competition for academic places was fierce. Tell us how you discovered Hedden and why you decided to write a biography of him. I first ran across Hedden while working on my doctoral dissertation on early African-American pilots. Um, he was one of the first African-Americans to learn to fly. I was thrilled when I discovered a striking newspaper photo of him at the controls of a Curtis-type biplane in 1912. I was drawn to uh, the serious expression in that photo and the confidence he exuded. I was also intrigued on a personal level by the fact, which was reported in a story alongside the photograph, that Hedden grew up 40 miles from my hometown in North Carolina. Pinning down the details of his life, though, proved fairly difficult, and although I mentioned him in the dissertation, I suspected he deserved more. Uh, later research confirmed those suspicions. After he gave up flying, Hedden made a name for himself as a public advocate for transportation technologies, as a race car driver and race organizer, as the holder of 11 patents, and as an entrepreneur. It seemed every direction in which I looked, I found him pioneering in some way. Uh, eventually, writing a biography seemed the best way to give him the recognition he deserved. Jill, you've had to recreate Hedden's story through historical detective work, which many family and local historians will identify with. What sources did you find to help with your research? There are a great many new resources now at our fingertips that I encourage everyone to explore. They made this biography possible. Hedden didn't leave any personal papers or business records. Uh, I located a small amount of archival material in the U.S. and the U.K., mostly patent records, business and corporation and tax records, scattered letters, military and government reports, and an advertising brochure for Hedden's car company. But these sources, though, they gave me only a limited insight into Hedden. So I quickly realized that I needed to zoom out and see the bigger picture of which he was a part. And to do that, I relied on two things, the extensive body of genealogical and newspaper databases and document databases now available to researchers online, and new scholarship on African Americans, the patent process, entrepreneurship, and other topics. The genealogical newspaper and document databases allowed me to uncover key relationships and events in Hedden's life, as well as in the lives of his family members, mapping out their educations through digitized school catalogs, their organizational memberships through fraternal church and other publications, and their social and professional connections through articles in newspapers, trade journals, and employee magazines. Um, I discovered the intellectual and social influences that surrounded Hedden, 
and the forms of assistance available to him. I also traced the relationships and backgrounds of his investors, his business associates, and even his rivals. Understanding those uh, with whom Hedden worked and their philosophies revealed to me a great deal about his own strategies and thinking. Then scholarly publications on topics ranging from black migration to British agriculture helped me put Hedden, his family, and his business partners into the context of their times, which allowed me to make more sense of the few archival sources I did have. All the sources I used were essential to writing the biography, but I will say that the most helpful to me were the personal news columns published in newspapers, black and white, in the 1920s and 1930s. They were written either by editors or contributed by community members who reported on their localities each week. And these provided key details about Hedden's daily life. They helped me establish his whereabouts and activities and often yielded personal observations of him. The details they provided added a depth to Hedden's narrative that I could not have provided any other way. So how did Hedden help the war effort? Hedden's converter kit sold briskly through the war and was his main contribution. He had, by 1939, patented a new gasket and added it to his kit to prevent unburned oil from seeping down into the engine's crankcase. Uh, the gasket increased the efficiency of oil-burning engines and it lessened the maintenance they required. These improvements encouraged lorry operators to switch to oil and save scarce petrol for the military. Uh, Hedden's gasket could also be added without the kit to Ford's and tractors, the most widely used tractor in the UK, without invalidating the Ford Motor Company's warranty. By increasing the efficiency of older tractors, his gasket made them more serviceable for farming and for airstrip mowing and earth moving on military bases. Hedden's personal contributions to the war effort included serving in the Camberley Regiment of the Surrey Home Guard's 1st Battalion and as a consulting engineer for local wartime industries. He also, according to family lore, volunteered his personal boat for use in the evacuation of Dunkirk. Although Hedden never gave up his American citizenship, he clearly saw England as his home and those in Camberley saw him as an integral part of their community. Tell us what you think is Hedden's legacy, both in the UK and the US. I think Hedden had multiple legacies. A uh, pioneer in aviation and the auto and racing industries, he helped popularize flying and motoring among America's black middle class. The philosophy he espoused encouraged black youth, male and female, to become engineers and manufacturers. His ideas were later adopted by two of the country's most important early black pilots, um, Bessie Coleman and William Powell, who advocated for black men and women to learn to fly, build their own planes and airports, and to develop aviation businesses. Hedden also left a legacy in British agriculture. I mentioned the importance of his converter kit for saving petrol and making older tractors serviceable in the war, but his kit and his gasket also contributed in another way. Uh, easy to install and relatively inexpensive, they kept farmers who were in the midst of a severe agricultural depression in the 1930s engaged with technology when many were tempted to save money by cultivating with horses alone. That continued engagement with machinery was a critical factor when war broke out and mechanical skills were sorely needed on farms to operate the tractors and other equipment needed to increase production. Finally, Hedden left a legacy as an aeronautical engineer. Designs he patented in the late 1930s for preventing ice formation and for removing ice from aircraft control surfaces and propellers became a model for subsequent inventors. His work has been cited by engineers from Curtis Wright, General Motors, Grumman Aerospace, Boeing, and Rolls-Royce, who between the 1940s and today have developed the modern anti-icing techniques that allow safe operation uh, not only of airplanes but of rotor aircraft and jet engines. And we still see Hedden's influence today. The most recent citation I've seen of his work appears in a 2018 patent for a thermal method to de-ice wind turbine blades. 
What do you think Hedden's story adds to our understanding of race relations in America and England? Hedden and his family often worked across racial lines. The church he attended as a child and the parochial schools from which he graduated were built through an alliance between his childhood pastor and white Presbyterians in the North. Hedden received his first patent for the Hedden Pettit spark ignition device with co-inventor Henry Pettit, a white railroad engineer from Georgia. And Hedden attracted a number of white investors for his businesses and inventions in the United States and in England. These instances of cooperation, I think, can provide a starting point to explore race relations in the past and today. For example, we can ask, why did whites cooperate with Hedden in a Jim Crow society? Was it friendship, a shared passion for technology, the desire to profit from black businesses, or a desire to feel magnanimous? It's critical for white Americans and Europeans to ask themselves similar questions today. We need to be aware of our motivations and our assumptions before we can engage in a meaningful way. Examining Hedden's life also shows us the toll of Jim Crow segregation, even for those who succeeded. Hedden's ability to obtain advanced technical training was limited, and he was denied skilled work in American industry. That forced him to teach himself engineering and isolated him from leading innovators. In addition, he had no access to bank capital. This meant he expended an inordinate amount of time and energy building coalitions of investors to finance his early businesses. To support his car company, he frequently had to travel across the country to appeal directly for stockholders through black churches and fraternities. The time and effort that required, coupled with the humiliations and complications of Jim Crow, siphoned off vital energies that could have gone into his inventions. Moreover, when he received his first patents, he was forced to rely on individual white investors, making him beholden to them and lessening his bargaining power. He had no other choices. Although legal Jim Crow no longer exists and civil rights have greater support today, many of the inequities head and faced are still with us and black Americans and Britons are still forced to bear the emotional costs of anti-black sentiment. I hope Hedden's experience can help us see how those inequities play out in a person's life. And finally, Jill, are there any thoughts that you'd like to leave us with? I think of everything I gained from writing Hedden's biography, the most important was an understanding of how important social networks are for individual success. Throughout much of his life, Hedden relied on networks that his family had built to pursue his dreams. He frequently turned to family members and to fellow Presbyterians and Republicans black and white, and to fraternal and other leaders for personal support and for the financing needed to develop his ideas. He also built networks of his own among those who shared his love of the automobile and the airplane. All those networks made it possible for him to sustain his career over many years until he could develop his ideas and attract greater investment. And once he immigrated to England, he benefited from the legal, business, and social networks his business partner, James Keel, had long worked to build in Camberley. And despite the fact that relationships within these networks were not always equitable, they were critical for Hedden to succeed. Thus, I think it's essential as we move forward that we continue to build networks. Equally essential is that we do the work required to make them open and fair. Jill, thank you so much for sharing more about Hedden's extraordinary life and career with us. Would you like to ask Jill a question about a particular aspect of Hedden's life or work? Do you have any reminiscences of Camberley, Frimley Green and Frimley in the 1930s, 1940s and 1950s? If so, why not get in touch with her through our Exploring Surrey's Past website? Details are on screen now.